Thank you, Pastor Rochelle. Hey, I tell everyone, I love Ocean's Church. I love Pastor Rochelle. She taught me how to pray. Pastor Mark taught me how to speak. Pastor Steffi taught me how to love people. Pastor Mel, come on, everyone is so great. You guys sit down, Jesus is awesome. I think I'll tell you my story as fast as I can. <laughs> but I think the one thing that it is, is I will never, I don't think pride could ever take hold of me because I watched as cops would pull me over, take drugs out of my car, throw them out and let me go. I watched as people died around me from overdose and suicide and I lived for some reason and I should be dead. When we joke, I should be in prison, I really should. And now I'm in this cute little blue suit. <laughs> All right, I gotta go fast, I gotta go fast, okay. My whole life, I, I was young. My sister got chronically ill when I was young. I faced a lot of just kind of inevitable rejection. My parents, no one meant it. I love my mom, she's here, I honor her. She never left my side, everyone was amazing. But as a kid, when you watch somebody in your family get all the attention, inevitably you're gonna feel empty. I struggled with gender dysphoria. I thought I should have been born a boy. I wanted to be a boy my whole life. So I looked like a tomboy, wore my brother's clothes to school. So, you know, inevitably guys weren't really attracted to me. And so I faced a lot of rejection, a lot of pain. From a young age, by middle school, I was a drug addict. And I don't mean just smoking weed. I mean, I did a lot of things legally in the state of California. I'm legally insane because of the amount of times I did acid and other drugs. I can't even use a podium. I'm like ready to fire it up. Okay. But I went on and I, I went through life. I was very promiscuous. I slept with hundreds of people. I was roofied in foreign countries and I would go around and I started living. Now I went to college, I graduated in Malibu and I actually started living in the LGBTQ influencer world in West Hollywood. I started dating girls, I ended up homosexual and I identified as a lesbian and came out to my family and I watched everything in front of my life just completely implode. Yeah. And I am the person who these days, I probably would be transgender. I probably would not have my life. I probably would not be doing anything and now, <laughs> I had developed a chronic STD I got healed from. I got married to a man. I have three sons. My mom's here, my family is all united. I've seen God do miracle after miracle. And I think the greatest revelation that I could share with you of just what God taught me, because I had this moment and I was like, God, he's like, salvation is free. All you have to do is ask, that's the good news. Forgiveness is free, all you have to do is ask. That's the good news. Yeah. So I said, well, great, I'm saved, I'm free. And then he's like, well, healing, just confess it to someone else and you're healed. I said, great, <laughs> I'm healed. And then I had this revelation of freedom and inheritance, which was freedom is free. We all have actually the same inheritance. It's the presence of God. But I said, Lord, why are some people more free than others? Because I said, I've been out of this for a year and I'm free. And I know people who are white knuckling their entire life, struggling with the things that I once did. What is the difference? And he said, Chloe, he said, people don't understand their inheritance. And I said, I got up, I stopped going to AA because I said, my name is Chloe, but I'm not an alcoholic. I said, my name is Chloe, but I'm not a drug addict. My name is Chloe, but I am freed. I am healed. And I'm not a lesbian, but I am a child of God and a daughter of the King. And I felt in this place, the one revelation I could give you is stop waiting on the ground. If you're the lame man, stop waiting for Jesus to get on the ground with you. He says, it's time to get up. And it spoke to my soul that misery loves company, but I'm not miserable anymore. So I love the King who sets me free. And there's liberation when you stop identifying as your sin. Because if you read the book of Romans, if you read the book of Romans, in Romans 6, it's going to tell you what baptism literally means. It means I submerge. Take me deeper. I submerge myself in the living water. And I literally physically go under because I have now been crucified. My old self is dead and gone. So although the devil might come to tempt me, he no longer has any authority because I hold the keys to hell and death. I hold all authority. But you have to realize to have authority, you have to live in obedience. 
And that's the difference between salvation, forgiveness, healing, but freedom. If you want to live in your inheritance, you have to be radically obedient. And it's hard, but it's worth it. I said, Lord, I'm fine if I never have sex again. I'm serious. Y'all don't even want to give up Instagram. Sorry, college students. I said, God, if I'm never going to have a family, I'll start an orphanage. I said, God, if, any, if everyone stares at me, I'll never work in the corporate world again. I said, Lord, I will do everything in my power to live a life of complete radical obedience and sacrifice to you. And sometimes you get tested, but every good teacher is quiet during a test. So if you hear, if you don't hear the voice of God for a minute, you got to pray harder. You got to lean in. He wants you to ask. He wants you to seek. He wants you to knock. And he says, if you keep leaning in with radical obedience, the door will be open. In Jesus' name. Well, hey, I'm... I can usually not even share my name in five minutes, but anyway, <laughs> Jess Bailey, please, come on, let's welcome her to the stage. I was actually joking with her. I said, I wanted to go first, but I clearly lost that prayer battle, but it was for a reason. This was, you just lit it up, girl, so I love you so much. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jess Bailey, and I am a content creator and a mom to a 10-month-old. So I love this topic about going deeper, because it's the only reason why I was able to be set free from all the things that I didn't even know were unclean things. Things that the world normalizes, glamorizes, the evil things that your zodiac sign tells you that you are, all that junk. It's all things that we are taught to just accept and live with. So my biggest uh, secret was that for 16 years, I was battling an eating disorder. When I was 15 years old, I began binging and purging multiple times a day. I got so good at doing it that I could literally do it at all my friends' house, all my family's homes. No one would ever know. But it became this all-consuming thing where the minute I woke up, my whole day, every hour was planned around when I could eat and when I could throw up. So it was also a huge reason why I didn't want to be a mother. I was like, how am I going to deal with the emotional, physical, mental thing of gaining weight, of like eating in excess? And how am I going to sustain a baby in my body if I can't even nourish it when I can't even nourish myself? So I thought, okay, you know what? If I become a mom, my deepest secret is gonna be exposed to the world. I knew if my baby came, I was already almost like speaking curses over it. I was like, he or she would come out with all these health issues. And then everyone would be like, what happened? I'm like, oh shoot. So I just kept pawning off motherhood. I was using my climbing success as an excuse, you know, trying to be this boss babe, whatever. But it was, <laughs> I just kept pawning it off. So at that point though, I think it was maybe three years ago, I was over it. Like I didn't want to live like this anymore. And that was about the time we had started coming to Oceans. And I'd grown up a Christian my whole life, but I would just, I would always like be begging God to help save me, but I didn't really know how to pray. So that Sunday, Pastor Mark was like, hey, we have this thing called free dive. And I was like, oh, of course. So if you guys are not familiar with free dive, it is this two day, super deep, intensive, just course that will, if you let it, like bring out all the deepest things in your soul and your life, everything, right? So if you have done it, you know that packet is thick. And there is like hundreds of things that I didn't even know were like unclean spirits. Jealousy, greed, pride, ego, lack of control or too much control, unforgiveness, all these things that, again, the world just normalizes, right? We just wake up and we just operate in it. And so, and of course, my eating disorder. So I said, okay, Lord, the amount of freedom that I live in is going to be determined by how vulnerable and honest I'm going to be with you. So I said, I'm getting real. I'm going to circle this packet. I'm going to circle things I operated in that my parents, my family, generational things, and we're done. We're, we're literally done with this. So on day two, the last session, Pastor Mark had called everyone up for prayer. And I remember actually seeing Karina. 
she was at the front and I just beelined it to her and I began weeping in her arms. I've never wept like that, you guys. I'm Asian, I don't have tears, I don't have feelings, okay? That's not a thing for us. So the fact that I literally wept that hard, I was like, what is going on? But I knew that everything was just falling off. I could feel like everything breaking off. And then when I had a moment, I got down on my knees and I repented. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry for opening that door to my eating disorder. And I kept just praying the blood. I kept praying victory. I kept declaring everything because I finally knew how to pray. And as I was saying that, literally this hot mass started exiting my stomach. Every single layer, every seven layers of my skin, it was like boom, boom, and it just left. And I tried to think of like all my triggers that could you know, cause me to throw up. And I would try to like say a sentence and the, the Lord just like cut it off. Like I physically, my mind didn't even go there anymore. So the thing that I thought was gonna end me up in rehab, the thing that I had kept a secret from my whole, like everyone in my life, not even my husband knew, the things that would have prevented me from creating a family, what could have ended my life, I was set free from. It was my heart posture, it was my desperation. Like I was really done and you have to want to be done with these things to be set free. You can't just kind of want it and go, oh, but I'm still gonna hide it and keep it a secret. No, we're done. Expose it, but in a humility way where it's like there's grace. Oceans is filled with grace. You have a huge team of women here. And so all those things, I just knew that Whatever I wasn't going to break off now with me, all those things, my family, things I was dealing with, my kids were gonna deal with. So how dare I like not do it and then I watch my kids struggle in the same things that we all struggled in? We're adults, we're strong, we can do it, our kids can't. So now that you have this congregation, you have Ocean's Church, you know that you can declare victory over anything. Now that I walk in this freedom, every single time a, like a little ick pops up, I, in the name of Jesus, grab authority over it. And I'm like, that's not me. It's not who I am. It's a lie and I do not accept it. And I'm so good at just constantly cleaning myself out. So. I encourage you guys, if you guys want to go deeper, if you want to be cleansed of this stuff, if you want to literally break off the things, not watch your children or your grandchildren suffer in what you know is a generational curse, you got to do it. You got to take the steps, be vulnerable, and go deeper. Thank you. And up next, we now have Pastor Mel Lunsford. Well, I'm so honored to be here this morning. How, how many of you are thankful to be in a house with such strong women of faith? It's so incredible. I just want to honor, I love my sisters, my mom. I, you guys are all here. I'm honored that you guys are here. Pastor Tracy, Pastor Connie, Pastor Rochelle, they have all impacted my life so much. I went to their church since I was eight years old in Boise, Idaho. They helped uh, raise me, disciple me all throughout high school. Um, I did their intern program there, their Bible college. Actually, Pastor Tracy, she helped me write my very first message. I actually think she wrote it and then I just preached it. <laughs> But I'm so thankful for all of you. Stephanie Dunson, she was like my big spiritual older sister. My mom would go to her and say, whatever Stephanie says, you can do. So Steph, I love you. I love all the women of this house. Well, I wanted to talk today about faith. My life has been marked by faith. And today I want us to go deeper in our faith. I had this specific word. I was actually just playing with my kids and I felt like the Lord had led me to the uh, verse in Luke chapter 18 in verse one through eight, the persistent widow. I'm going to read this off to you starting in verse one. It says this, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. And he said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice from my adversary. And for a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who will cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Never 
nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Have you ever been worn down so much that you end up giving in? I'm a mom of three boys, three uh, three, um, and under. And so my sons, well, just two of them. One of them can't talk. But he goes, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. I don't know if you're a mom or a grandma, but it's so sweet. But at the same time, we're like, oh, my gosh, what, 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 Nash, what? And he just keeps saying, Mommy, can I have a Popsicle? Mommy, can I have a Popsicle? I'm like, yes. We will later. Yes, we will later. After nap time, he wakes up from nap time. Mommy, can I have a popsicle? I'm like, how did you remember? I'm like, I didn't even remember, right? So I always, I'm the parent that gives in. Ah, I try to not, you know, I really hold it out. I hold, 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 hold. I'm like, ugh, I need peace in my life. Here you go. But I always end up giving in because I don't know about you, but it's hard to not give something to my child that's been wanting something, talking about something for a while. It's already in my heart to give it to them. It's just a matter of timing. And so we see in Luke chapter 18, it's this widow who ends up receiving what she believed for because she was a woman of faith. She believed for justice and didn't stop until she got it. And so I believe in this story, it shows us three keys of faith. Um, And if you want to go deeper in your faith, I encourage you to write this down is number one, the first key to faith that she had was persistence. Now, she stood firm over a long period of time. She was steadfast. She was immovable. uh, And she stood on the promises of God. And how do we know this? Well, she was firm in her confession. We see as she goes to the unjust judge, she doesn't ask a question. She doesn't come even begging. She says, give me justice from my adversary. She was coming with a command. And so she came standing firm firm in her confession that I am going to receive that this justice that I am believing for. And I believe us as Oceans Church women that we have to attach our confession to our faith. Now, if your confession isn't full of faith, you're canceling that faith out. And so I love this. We all know this, that our words speak life and they speak death. So we choose our confession. I love Bill Johnson. If you know him, you love him. Bill Johnson said this, be careful not to abort the promises of God through carelessness in your speech or invite the enemy to build a stronghold of fear and doubt. How many times do you think that we abort the promises of God because our confession is not of faith? Maybe our confession is complaint. Maybe our confession is negativity. Maybe our confession is fear and doubt. But I'm telling you this morning that there is power in our confession when we speak it in faith. I don't want to abort the promises of God. I want the promises of God to be delivered here and now. Amen? Amen. Amen. So she was persistent. How do you know if you have faith? Well, your mouth reveals your heart. Because we know out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So check your heart. Amen? Number two, she had perseverance. Perseverance is continuously doing something despite difficulty or delay. Can you imagine the community that she was around that saw her every day going to the unjust judge, commanding the same thing? They're probably like, oh my gosh, look at this lady again. She's not going to get it. I don't know why she keeps praying. Why does she keep going to the judge? I'm sure she was embarrassed. I'm sure there was moments of as she was walking that there was doubt. Maybe there was fear, but at the end of the day, she was persistent and she kept believing despite the difficulty, despite what other people thought, despite how it looked she persevered so we have to persevere number three is we pray when we pray we have to have the humility and faith like a child I love this the Bible talks about a childlike faith a childlike trust that is vulnerable we know this about kids well, if you're, even if you're a parent, it was so funny. I was at the pool the other day, and uh, these parents this, had a little kid, and the little kid was like, oh, mommy, I want to go play in the grass over here. And they're like, oh, we can't. The door's locked. And I looked over, and it's a push door. And I was like, ah, oh, classic. But the kid, you know, because the parents are like, no, we, I want to go home, you know? 
But it was so funny because the kid was like, yeah, if mom said it, I believe it. And it was no questions asked, and then they moved on. And so when we come into prayer, it's having this childlike trust in faith, knowing that God, if you said it, I am not going to doubt it, but I believe it, that I'm gonna stand firm and be immovable, that I'm gonna persevere even when it's difficult, and I'm gonna believe you like my child believes everything that I say, because your promises are yes, and amen. Amen. So I want to encourage you today to continue to pray, not lose heart, as Jesus commanded us in the beginning of the scripture. And I'm over classic, I figured. And I'll, and I'll end with this, is when I was believing to get pregnant, I didn't think I was going to be the one to miscarry because there was nothing wrong with my body, I thought. And so when you go through something like a miscarriage, it can be hard, it can be complicated. No one has an answer for it. So there's, there's a lot that you process through. And these were the three things that helped me get through that healing was that I believed, you know what? I'm standing firm. God, you called me to be a mom. I'm going to persevere. When all my friends are getting pregnant, I'm going to cheer them on, but I'm still going to believe. Even when it's difficult and I might get sad, I'm going to believe what you spoke over me, and I'm going to continue to pray until I see that baby come. And I prayed that God would send, I didn't beg, I didn't ask, but I commanded that God would send my son Nash from heaven and he'd begin to form him in my womb. And it was three weeks later that God gave me Nash. And, ever, and then I had three babies in 33 months. So I believe this for you. Pray, don't lose heart, and you will see the promises of God come into your life. Amen. Well, I want to welcome up my beautiful friend, Karina. She has an amazing word for you today. Thank you, Mel. That was so beautiful. And I just am so honored to be up here. And first, I just want to honor you, Pastor Rochelle and Pastor Mark. Honestly, when we stepped foot in this place three years ago, our lives completely changed. They prayed such bold prayers over us, even prayers that I didn't even know how to do. So thank you. If you don't know who I am, my name is Karina Cook. I am married to the most humble, beautiful, talented, anointed man of God, Pastor David Ryan Cook. Yes. He is one of our worship leaders here and one of our worship pastors here. And I always thought that this was for him, not for me. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> So a little bit about my story is I was a very independent, confident person. I knew who I was. I knew what I wanted to do. I loved working. I loved my job. I loved my life. So 12 years ago, I moved to Australia knowing that I was going to live this beautiful life. I had all these plans and dreams. I meet my husband, and I am just dreaming with God. I am going to be a businesswoman. I am going to travel. I am going to be an actress, maybe. Who knows? I had all the dreams, okay? And then um, I have a bit of a different story than a lot of other women here. I know that a lot of women are praying to become pregnant one day, start a family, and just step into that. And I am truly believing that for you because that is the most beautiful gift that you can ever have. However, that wasn't really my story. So six months after we got married, I ended up getting pregnant, and it's just not what I wanted. And it's a very hard thing to say because I know that that's a very lonely statement to say, but it's just not what I wanted. I knew that I wanted to be a mother one day, but not then. I had all these dreams, all these plans, and then I just felt like in an instant, it was all taken from me. I felt like my life was over, and so I had to learn how to deal with it. I had my husband who was looking at me and he was saying, this is the best thing ever. And I'm standing here and saying, no, it's not. Like, this is not what I want. This is not, this is not what I thought I wanted. And 10 weeks later, so the baby in my belly, it was 10 weeks into it, I, we had thought that we had lost him. So I was bleeding a lot. I had a very, very difficult night. And I, we were sitting there praying and we just realized like, okay, this was the end of it. And that was the moment that I got on my knees and I, and backstory, I grew up Christian. I've known of God my whole life, but I felt like I had just lost myself in that moment. So I got on my knees and I said, God, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry that I ever thought any of those thoughts that weren't for you. And I'm so sorry that I ever spoke 
these lies over my life that I didn't want the plans that you had for me. And I said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I invited him back into my life because I do believe that sometimes it's a daily ask. So I asked God, please come back, help me figure this out, be with me. I am so lonely in this moment. Give me the courage and give me the confidence to step into the woman that you have placed for me. If you want me to have this child, please let me have this child. And so two days later, it was quite a journey. We found out that the baby was perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. Yes, thank you, Jesus. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this journey. I'm going to become a mom. And I walked three years of learning how to not be anxious, how to not be depressed. I was clinically depressed at the time. And I had to walk in this confidence. And if there's one thing that I want you guys to write down, if you guys want to get deep with God, this is my secret sauce, okay? Write down, Jesus confidence. I was walking in my own strength this whole time and trying to figure these things out on my own. And this whole time I was missing out on Jesus confidence, being a confident woman in God. What does that mean? That means you're not anxiety. You're not depressed. That is not your life. You are not sick. That is not who you are. Who are we? We are beautiful women. We are strong. Yes, sometimes we have insecurities. I think we all do. But that is not our story. That is not who we are. So ask God, how can I invite that Jesus confidence into that insecurity? Step into it. How can I invite Jesus confidence into the sickness or into the circumstances? Because, guys, these, this life is hard. We all have hard stuff. This past year was one of my hardest years I've ever had. I was sick for a whole year. We literally had to throw away everything in our home because we had a mold situation. I literally became the mold girl. Everybody comes to me now and is like, how did you deal with it? And I'm like, honestly, you guys, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus helped me. I had my best friend Jess tell me one day, she said, you know what? The devil's trying to steal your voice. And I said, I am not going to accept that. You know what? I'm going to step in. I'm going to use my voice and I'm going to be confident in Jesus. And as, and as I decided to do that, when I stepped into that, this was just this past December, I said, I'm going to use my voice. I'm going to share my story. And here I am sharing my story. I'm going to be bold about what God's going to do. And I said, I am healed in the name of Jesus. And in March, I was healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I know that that was all from Jesus' confidence, the confidence that God gave me. And so I just want to say, if you want to go deep with God, Ask God, where can you replace Jesus' confidence in that area of your life? Because I promise you, if you lean into that, and if you grab a hold of that, you guys all will be different. You women can all help other women out because your story is bigger. Thank you. Thank you. I would love to introduce my sister-in-law, Jess. Karina Cook, I love you so much. I love you so much. Hi, everyone. Oh, I just did my princess voice. My name is Jess. I'm married to that amazing man that's behind that console every Sunday. I love you. Um, we have three amazing kids. We have Ava, Hannah, and baby Benjamin. I, oh, he's back there. Oh, my sweet boy. Um, I am the youngest of 10 children. <laughs> My parents immigrated here from Romania with nine kids, and then they had me, their American baby. <laughs> um, I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony with you. I'm going to try and keep it in the time frame. If it's okay, I'm a very practical person, so I'm going to go a little more practical with you and kind of show you the journey that I took and kind of what I did practically to get deeper with the Lord. So... Um, on my wedding day, during the reception portion of my wedding, my sister ran up to me and she's like, hey Jess, something's wrong with dad. He seems really, really upset. Could you come really quickly and come and talk to him and see what's going on? So I went to go look for my dad and when I found him, I didn't know at the time, he didn't know at the time, but he was struggling with the idea that he was gonna lose his daughter. I'm also very, very close to my parents because I'm the last one. And so, um, I start talking to him and realized that he had just talked to someone and someone had cracked a joke about him losing his daughter and it had triggered a lot of emotions and different things. And so I go up to him and he go, he just starts saying, 
such hurtful things, guys, stuff that you just would never expect from your dad, let alone on your wedding day. Um, I ended up walking away, just wasn't the place or time, so I walked away, and I just remember just being so hurt and confused. Honestly, confusion was like crazy because I was such a daddy's girl. I walked away. I had to continue with the day, obviously, so it kind of kept going. And then um, we end up leaving for our honeymoon. We come back from our honeymoon, and uh, to make matters worse, we end up moving to Redding, California, to Bethel Church. And my, I'm the first one out of my family. All 10 of us live in SoCal at this time, and I'm the first one to move, so it just piles on for him. And so Unfortunately, right before we moved, it was, it was always at the goodbyes. We get to the goodbyes, and it was a really hurtful moment with him where he was just rehashing everything. Shout out to you, my love. You did so well in that moment. You were so gracious. Yeah, he was so upset in the moment, I think, but, but he was just so patient and peaceful, and, and you loved him so well through a really hard season. So thank you for that, babe. Um, so anyways, um, Every, little did I know this propels me into three years, guys, or so. It's probably a little over three years. Every trip back to come and visit my family, we have an awesome trip. At the end of the trip, he ends up rehashing everything again. Every rune opens up again. I'm struggling, so I'm, we're going back and forth, and I end up leaving crying every single trip for three. And I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. Every trip for three years. So at that point, I'm like, okay, God, I can't do this anymore. I need healing. I need you to help me to learn how to forgive my dad. I need you to just completely transform me. I need to be more like you. I need to love like you. I need to, I, I need to see people like you, and I need to see him like you. I just ask God, please heal me. Take me deeper. Yeah. And so I pray that prayer. And here's the, the more practical side. So it, it, I, I just drench myself in the word, in worship, in prayer. I started declaring the word over my life. Do not read your Bible quietly. I'm telling you, it makes a difference. When I read the Bible, I say it out loud. First of all, guys, we get distracted. It's normal. So I make sure to read it out loud. And then what I do is I declare it. I declared it over my situation. I declare it over myself, over my dad, over my, my whole family. And God started to renew my mind. It was wild. And then worship, I drowned and worship was amazing. Luckily we worked for the church and so I was able to have worship at home, worship at work. I had worship on all, all the time. But what I noticed with worship is, you know, we've heard this before, but it can shift an atmosphere. Guys, it postured my heart. Every time I was angry or frustrated or just couldn't deal, I couldn't deal with the feelings and emotions I was feeling. I would put worship on. I would surrender it all to God, and he'd reposture my heart. Yeah. I would be a happier person, just a better person, and, and just unload on him, and it was so, so amazing. Yeah. And then third, prayer. Um, out of the three, I, I do lean towards this one more. I love, love prayer. I talk to God all the time, all the time. Actually, funny story. <laughs> one time when I was walking towards work, I was in constant communication with him. I remember walking, and I tripped. And I looked up and I went, he thought that was funny, huh, God? <laughs> like, it had gotten to that point where I was talking to him all the time. But in the beginning, I made sure to make a habit of not putting on worship music in the car. So what I would do is my car time was my prayer time. And it was amazing. I would pray and declare things over my day, over my coworkers, over whatever it looked like, protection, safety, all of that stuff. Oh, guys, and the best part, when I'd come home, I'm sure you love this love, but I would unload with him in the car so that when I came home, I, I would come a healthier me and would just release it to the Lord so that it wouldn't affect my behavior, wouldn't affect, you know, how I was talking and acting. And so it was amazing. And in that season, I really noticed that God was working on my discernment and really teaching me how to know how to deal with certain circumstances in my life. I found that the important thing, oh, it was direction. So he gave me direction every time I'd, I'd, I'd go to him in prayer. And so I just want to say prayer makes you more aware and it makes you more receptive to the Holy Spirit. And that's what I grew in as I grew in prayer. Um, those three things, guys, were 
uh, just foundational disciplines that to this day I still do. I still practice. It's not perfect. But now, now it's not so dramatic anymore where I have to establish certain times. I'm doing it because I love doing it. The desperation turned into hunger, and the hunger turned into relationship. And that's going deeper. I don't want to leave you hanging. I'll make it quick. But I just I want to give you the happy ending to the story. Um, I hung out at my sister's house, and I was watching my dad play with my daughter. And I just had this moment of just like, oh, he's so amazing, like, gosh, 23 grandkids, and he's still playing with my kids and crawling on the floor. Yeah. And it was gone. The bitterness, the anger, yeah. everything was gone. Yeah. I didn't feel it anymore, and I only felt love yeah. for him. It was the most amazing yeah. feeling. And I just want to say that depth with the Lord, it bears fruit. Yeah. And so I just want to give you another moment where I saw it bears such amazing fruit in my life. There was a God moment that I had where God intentionally brought up this memory of when I was hanging out um, at my parents' house. And at the end of, of that, that memory that I was thinking of, I remember walking away with tears on my face. And I went to go pick up my daughter, and she just stared at me, kind of perplexed, like, why are you crying? What's going on? And I had, you know, we had rehashed things with my dad. And I was thinking about it with God, and I was like, God, did it have to go that far? Did it have to look like that? And I just had this, I don't know how else to describe it, but the stillness come over me. And I just heard the Lord say, Jess, that season was essential for us to contend for generational breakthrough. And I was like, God, you don't just deliver, you over deliver. Your promises are so true. God, it's so amazing to just, to not, First of all, to just not have daddy issues, I was so, so happy. Like, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. But in addition to that, my girls get to see a healthy me. My, my children will never have to deal with that or know what that's like. And so I, I am just so grateful to the Lord. I just want to leave you with this. I just want you guys to know that he is for you. I want you to know that his nature is good. I want you to know that he delivers in abundance, in abundance. He is always faithful. Go deeper with him. It's so worth it. So worth it, ladies. Thank you so much. I would love to announce the amazing intercessor, Tammy. That was so good. Well, thank you. Okay, everybody, you can sit down. So I am so honored to be on this panel today. Are you loving this collective, ladies? Isn't it so good? And so, Pastor Rochelle, we love you so much, and we love this house. And I am so excited to share part of my testimony with you today about how God taught me my true identity, and he freed me from orphan mindsets. These mindsets were preventing me from being able to go deeper with the Lord. I grew up a spirit-filled Christian, but I didn't know God's love for me, and I didn't trust him. I did all the right things as a Christian girl, but I did it because I was afraid of being punished by God. I did everything in my own strength. And then after my husband, you guys might know him as Bruce the Baptist... After Bruce and I got married, um, my mom and I opened a tea room and clothing boutique in Old Town Orange, and it was amazing. Five years into running our business, I desperately, Bruce and I desperately wanted a baby, and I was having a really, really hard time getting pregnant. So we were trying for over a year. I had surgery, and there was a lot of prayer and finally, I got pregnant. And three months into that pregnancy, we lost our baby. And I was heartbroken in that moment. And I know how a lot of you um, feel in that time. And all of my past wounds came to the surface. But the good thing about that is they needed to come to the surface so that God could heal me. So I cried out to the Lord for help. And it says in Psalms 34, 17 through 19, the righteous cry out for help. And the Lord heals them. 
I'm sorry, he hears them. He delivers them from all of their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So if any of you have had a miscarriage, I just want to release healing over you right now, over your heart, that God, you are healed in Jesus' name. And if you're going through a hard season, I just declare over you right now that God is going to deliver you from all of your troubles. And he has done this for me in so many times in my life. So in this time, he gave me five keys of how to go deeper with him. And they are things that I still use today. And so if you're taking notes, um, the five keys are number one is draw near. And so it says in James 4, 8, to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So we take that first step. And having hunger, hungering to be in God's presence. And then he fills us up. It's a promise that he says in Matthew 5, 6. And then also abide. When, we, uh, when um, we abide in him, we are staying connected to him all the time, talking to him all the time and praying. And then number four is obey. When we obey him, we live in his love. And then number five is praise and thanks. It says in Psalms 104 that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. God inhabits our high praise. And God, when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings freedom and healing in every area. So God took me deeper into his heart when I spent time with him and did these things. And he healed me from the inside out. He taught me that my identity was not in the things that I do, that my identity is in being his daughter. And if you struggle with some of the same things that I did, invite the Holy Spirit to come in and do a work in you and press in and go deeper with him. He is waiting for you to draw near to him. So five months after we lost our baby, God gave my husband and I a double blessing. <laughs> we got pregnant with twin boys. And some of you know our boys. They're Caleb and Cody. We are so proud of them. Shout out to Oceans College. They just graduated from Oceans College, and we couldn't be more proud of them. And so I'm going to close with this. Um, I asked God for a scripture and for something that I can just release prophetically over you. And he gave me Psalms 42.7. And it says, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. And God told me that in this season, he's calling all of us to go deep with him. And then he's going to pour in his refreshment over us like a waterfall. And it's going to fill us and keep filling us. The more we go deeper with him, the more we get into his presence, the more that we spend time with him, he's going to keep filling us to overflow. And rivers of living water are going to flow out of each one of you here. So thank you so much. I'm going to introduce Pastor Mel. Can we thank Tammy for that beautiful word? I love Tammy. She is the sweetest, kindest, most amazing person. And I'm so excited. You guys doing good? You hung in there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this. We're going to close it out. Um, but before we do that, I know we have honored her, but we cannot over-honor her. Pastor Rochelle, thank you so much for the way that you lead every single woman, everything that's what talked about here. Pastor Rochelle has so consistently walked out again and again, leading the charge and what it looks like to love Jesus more and more. Her and Pastor Mark have been my pastor since I was 14 years old. So they've got good fruit. Um, but I'm so grateful for her, Pastor Connie, her mom, Pastor Tracy. Both of them have been so instrumental to in my walk, and I'm just so honored that they're here today. Come on, can we honor them one time? 
everything that everyone's been sharing, I hope you're really leaning into it because there's so much power in everything that's being shared. And this is just how I felt like the Lord wanted to close today. I think for me, so much of my story, I love what Jess Ferris said, so much of walking deeper with the Lord, it really does come down to those three things she said, to reading the word, to prayer, to worship. You can't get around it. I think sometimes we're looking for another way. We're looking for a formula. We're looking for a different different route, but it will always come back to the word of God. It will always come back to prayer. It will always come back to worship. And I think what I've realized just in the last, you know, however many years, I don't know, of me walking with the Lord is those things are powerful. And I think some of you guys, even in this room, you'd say, I'm doing those things, but I don't really feel a shift and I still feel stagnant and I don't feel like God's responding to me and I'm crying out to him and I'm doing my part, but I don't see the part where it says, if I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. And I think what I have come to realize is there is a key that actually unlocks all three of those things. And without this one key, you will not experience the fullness of what those three pillars are meant to produce in your life. And that key is very simple. Now, so much of our walk with Jesus is actually very simple, but that is not the same thing as being easy. <laughs> but the key is simple, and it comes down to this. You have to yield. You have to yield. It's not enough to just read the word. It's not enough to just pray. It's not enough to just lift up the name of Jesus in high praise. If you don't yield, then there won't be transformation. If you don't yield then you won't grow deeper in your walk with the Lord. And I love James 4, 7, and 8. Tammy just quoted part of it, but I'm going to quote the whole part. The first part, it says, Therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Then verse 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And the second half of verse 8 says this, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That sounds kind of harsh, but I think there's something about the process of drawing near to God that we realize ultimately that's what comes to the surface. And isn't it funny that God never exposes double-mindedness on the mountaintop? It's not in the high moments of life, right? As we draw near to God, we expect to have these great mountaintop pinnacle moments with God. And there are moments like that with God. But oftentimes in our drawing near to God, it looks more like being on the backside of a desert. It looks more like a low place. Because what I have found in my own life is that whatever double-mindedness is hiding down here doesn't come out when everything is good and beautiful and pleasant and full of joy and miracles and breakthrough it comes out of me in the low place it comes out of me when what I'm praying for and believing for doesn't come through it comes out of me when I'm waiting longer for something than I anticipated to wait but Hebrews 11:6, we know it we're familiar with it but it's key in understanding this walk of going deeper with the Lord it says but everyone who would come to God who would walk with him must necessarily so without question, this can't be something that you're uncertain about. It can't be something you're still trying to figure out. Must necessarily believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And isn't God so good that he would expose the double-mindedness in us so that we can experience the full reward of his presence, the full overflow of his goodness. And over and over again, I've seen it at 17 years old when I was sitting at an altar at a camp in McCall, Idaho, God exposing unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment that I had in my heart towards my dad because of different things that were said, different things that happened when I was growing up. And it was on the backside of a desert called unforgiveness that I learned in that moment, because I know what the Bible says. I know that Jesus makes it clear that if I don't forgive myself, then God cannot continue to extend forgiveness to me. I know it. But in that moment, I had to submit to it. In that moment, I had to resist the temptation to justify myself. And I understood that I could stay justified or I could get healed and walk in intimacy with God, but I couldn't have both. And in that moment, I had to submit to the Lord. I had to resist the enemy. And as I drew near to God, he drew near to me 
and he exposed what was not single-minded within me. When I was 19 years old, I struggled with debilitating fear. I was in the second year of our Bible college in Idaho. I could not sleep at night. I had night terrors every day. When I would sit in my classes, my mind would be running rampant. I had never doubted. I had never questioned my faith. I didn't wonder if God existed. But all of a sudden, I had all these thoughts swarming in my head. What am I even doing here? I couldn't even pick up my Bible to read it because as soon as I did, I felt tormented in my mind and I could see myself breaking it down and telling myself why it wasn't true and why God was not who he said he was. And I cried out to God for nine months. I stood on the word. I stood in prayer. I stood in worship and nothing happened. It felt like nothing happened. And on the backside of a desert called unbelief, the Lord met me. And I came to a place where I had to just choose to continue to submit myself to God to resist the temptation to believe the lie that God was not who he said he was, that all of it was made up, that I would remember these moments with God and I would have to fight to remind myself that the truth of God's word was still true, even though I didn't feel it, even though I was crying out in the night because I couldn't sleep and it didn't feel like any breakthrough was coming. I had to hold, I had to cling to the word of God, to Hebrews 10, 23, that says we hold unswervingly to the hope that we prefer because he who promised is faithful and on the backside of a desert called unbelief God met me and he healed me and there was a moment it was nine months in where everything shifted and everything left and I have not been bound by fear or anxiety since and over and over and over again to moving here being 28 uh, my, my husband Joel we're the associate pastors here we've been married for 10 years we have one daughter. When we moved here, she was a year and a half. And it was the worst year of our lives. Moving here in obedience to God. And I'm not exaggerating that, you guys. I'm, I'm not making it up. We had a car repossessed. We were one late payment away from being evicted from our apartment. We barely had money to pay our power bill. There was a couple months it got shut off. We barely had money to put food in the fridge. My husband was Ubering like 14 hours a day. And we were still falling late on all of these things. Now, some of that was poor stewardship on our part. But the Lord was so intentional to lead us through that year. And there were so many places where I realized I was not submitted to the truth of God's word. And I didn't know how to resist. And I didn't know how to not be double-minded. And here's where I realized I was double-minded in that season, that I knew that God was good. I had no problem praying for people and declaring over them that God was good. But what I didn't know was in me was that I didn't believe that God was good to me not the way that he was to everyone else. And it was on the backside of that desert that God exposed that double-mindedness. And he didn't deliver me out of that place. He delivered me through it because he cared more that the image of Christ be formed in me and that I would be secure and steadfast in every season that would follow. So don't ask God to take it away. Take the words of James, submit yourself to the things of God, submit yourself to the word of God, continue to resist the enemy, and as you draw near to him, ask him to make you single-minded, because what I didn't know in that season of moving here is that two years later, God would give us a word that we were going to have two more children. And that that process would be more than four years in the making, and we're still standing on it, but you know what? I'm not double-minded about God's promises anymore. I'm single-minded in it. I don't wake up depressed. I don't wake up sad. I don't wake up discouraged because I know God is who he says he is. And he does what he says he will do. And as you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Amen. 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 Well, can you give all these ladies a huge hand? That was all amazing. You guys can make your way back to your seat. Thank you so much. Each and every word was so profound and so beautiful. Amen. Amen. Well, how about you do this before we step into, because it's getting hot in here. How about you, you stand up and we just greet somebody really quick and say, hey, you look good today. And we'll just take a little break. back 
back to your seats. Women like to talk. Well, as you make your way back to your seat, I have the privilege and the honor to introduce my beautiful sister, Pastor Tracy Wild Pace. And she happens to have the most incredible, cute little boy who is my nephew. And I don't know why she didn't bring him, but I'm kind of mad at her that she didn't. But she's going to come up and speak. But I have to tell you, my sister is just an incredible, prolific, prophetic communicator. I think she's one of the best communicators. I, I'm, you're going to hear it today. So we get to hear from her today. But she's the best mom, the best leader. She leads with confidence. And I love her. When we are growing up, she also sings as well. She's a singer. We were in a band, me, my cousin, and her. But then it was called Unheard Melodies. We were never heard. It was prophetic. We were never heard except for at our church. My mom was like, get up there, girls. And then we did open up for the Katinas, but it was because of dad and mom. <laughs> Somebody's like, who did you open up for? We're like, the Katinas. They're like, wow, they are so good. And we're like, yeah, it was at my dad's church. And so it didn't really matter. So anyway, but she is beautiful on the inside and the out. And I love her. She's the best mom, best leader. And I'm just excited. She's my best friend. And so you get to hear from her today. So can you help me welcome Pastor Tracy Wild Pace? How, hi. They put a fan on me, so it might be Beyonce up in here, but. Oh my gosh, Pastor Rochelle, I call her Rochelle, but I also call her Pastor Rochelle because you give honor where honor's due. I mean, can you believe the women of this church? That's such an amazing, that all of the, I'm like, why am I here? There's no point. I'm just here to receive. That was so incredible and such a fruit, the fruit of Pastor Rochelle. She truly does believe and um, release women and believes in the call of God. And so I received from every single one of you, thank you ladies for your testimony, for the fruit of your life, for the call of God upon your life and sharing. There's something powerful. The, the Bible says this, we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And you have to have that. And you don't love your life unto death. And I just think there's always faith that's stirred and you're encouraged when you hear uh, the testimony of God. Um, but yes, I love my sister. She is my best friend. Um, it was really hard. I lived in LA for three years and she was in Boise. I came home to Boise and like about a year and a half later, they decided to move to Orange County. And so we've been, it's not okay for us. Okay. So this, I'm pretty sure she invites me just so that she can mostly see my son and then also we can hang out. But I love my sister. She has always been who she is. The woman of God that you see, the woman of faith, the woman of prayer, the one who believes in people who is who she's been her whole life. She's been this beautiful since she came out of the womb. Everyone in Boise would be like, where are you from? To my sister. And they'd look at me and be like, obviously you're from Boise. But they'd be like, where are you from? And my sister would be like, here. And they're like, no way. This woman was made for Orange County. She's as beautiful inside as she is outside, if you get to know her. And then our beautiful mom, who we've learned everything from, <laughs> Pastor Connie Wild is here. She's my, tr she's my entourage for this trip. And we would not be who we are if it wasn't for our mom. Like, you talk about uh, Pastor Rochelle and her intercession and her prayer. It's from our mom. Our mom taught us to pray. Our mom told us to have faith. Our mom told us, taught us to love the church, build the church. Um, but also to have fun in life. We, we had the best childhood because of our amazing parents. And all three of their children are in full-time ministry. And um, it's just pretty awesome. So I am so excited to be here. Um, I'm going to do a couple things before we get started. Because, man, I just feel like everything. I was like, should I just say ditto, 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 ditto? Um, I do want to... Uh, I'm gonna give a couple books away. I have, I've written two books. 
Um, and I mostly just don't want to take them home, so please buy them so I don't have to put them in a suitcase on the way home. I wrote a book called the Finding the Lost Art of Empathy. I tell my story, a lot of my story, which I'm not going to have time to um, talk about today, but uh, many years ago, I went through a personal tragedy, and what I discovered is that, surprisingly, the church wasn't the best at dealing with trauma for people and grief. And it wasn't because they don't care about people in love. They just didn't know what to do. And, you know, because we believe in a good God and we believe, you know, we believe we have faith and we trust God. But there are seasons of life that happen and disappointments happen. And just like some of these women talk about going through miscarriages and different things. I think the church should be the best at walking people through grief and um, surrounding them with empathy. And, um, and so I wrote this book, and a lot of it is for obviously someone who's going through something, but really the mission behind writing it was for, to teach the church how to walk alongside others. So I wanna give this away to anyone. I specifically was thinking if there's some, oh, you have your hand up, girl, you get it, come on up. Or an usher can take it, you get it. If someone wants to take it to that awesome, lady, or you can get it after the service, whatever you guys want to do. You're great. And then the second book I wrote was Contentment, The Sacred Path. I don't even know what the subtitle is because the <laughs> basically the publisher makes you do this kind of stuff, okay? The Sacred Path to Loving the Life You Have. Yeah, that sounds good. Contentment. <laughs> I came up with contentment. They were like, what about this? I'm like, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. Um, so my story, Pastor Rochelle's um, story is a little bit different in her journey. Uh, Pastor Mark was the first person she ever dated, kissed. Um, I was single until I was 39. It wasn't like I was dating around, so don't, it's not like that. It just, I didn't get married <laughs> until I was 39. And there were seasons of my life that I was like, I was loving Jesus, serving him. I wasn't, you know, I, 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 it just, the guy didn't show up. Well, it was because I was waiting for him to grow up because he's a little bit younger. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> My sweet husband. Little did I know, I was just waiting for him to be born. I'm kidding. It's not that bad. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is going to be fun. Okay. So I was 39. I was 40 when I had my first baby. I'm here to tell you, if you're holding on to a promise, God is in your story. It's never too late. God has great plans for you. So I want to give this to one of the single ladies that's just been holding out. You got it. Mom, to right behind you. God is in your story, okay? And if you want to get the books, they're out there. They're, as, they're cheaper than you can get them anywhere else. Please just buy them for anybody who needs that story. And um, anyway, okay, well, I love you. I'm so excited. Okay, did we get the picture of my son? Okay, so right before I was about to get up here, this is my son's current state. I was like, Garrison. So the first thing I said, because I'm an OCD mom, I go, did he get any marker on furniture or walls? And he goes, no, just him. And I'm like, okay, that's fine then. <laughs> this is Declan August Kessler Wild Pace. We call him Dak, because he's got too many names. His dad and I have a hard time making decisions. This is my sweetest almost three-year-old who needs his mom, clearly, but dad and, dad and Daki are having a good time even though they're not here. But yes, I am, have the best husband and the best son He's pretty cute, right? Yeah. I know. I think so, too. Um, all right. Let's get into the word, okay? You didn't bring me here just to look at my son, although we could do that all day, and we would have so much fun. Um, God, I really feel like God gave me this word for this amazing group of women. Um, we're this is the title of the talk, if you want it. It says, put some manure on it. You can say poop if you want. Seems inappropriate in church. So I'm going to say manure. I'm a boy mom, Okay. I hear about poop all day long. Like, my sister, Pastor Rochelle, only had girls, and so she has a hard time. She'll FaceTime, and he'll do something. She goes, oh, Daki, don't do that. Oh, that's rough. I'm like, he's a boy, Rochelle. You had girls. He's wrestling me. He's, I mean, I, most of the time, he's tackling my face, you know? And Rochelle's like, oh, Daki, don't do that to your mama. And I'm like, this girl needed a boy, you know? So I, I can't, I'm just a boy mom. So it's like, let's put some manure on it. That's the title. Okay, we're going to go to the Bible in Luke chapter 13. I'm going to read a little portion of text. This is a parable in Luke's gospel. I love Dr. Luke. Um, he gives us some good detail. No other, no other gospel writer, I think, would have written the word manure. So I think only Dr. Luke would give us poop in the Bible. Okay, so he says, and he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. 
And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three now, years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if, I should, and then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Somebody say, put some manure on it. Let me just pray as we get into the word and we, we're, God's going to do something powerful in our lives. Amen, ladies. Jesus, we thank you for what you've already done today. Lord, it's just, it's, it's amazing when women come together, your daughters, your girls who you love so much. Lord, you know everything that they walked into and they're carrying. But God, I thank you that you're the God who sees beyond what they even are holding in their hand right now. You see the future. Lord, you see the past, you see the present, and you're in all of it. And Jesus, we just ask today that your Holy Spirit would come and just open our hearts to receive whatever it is you want to talk to us about. God, I thank you always. What a privilege and an honor it is to preach your word. But beyond that, I ask Holy Spirit, you speak, you move, and you do what you want to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, you know that Pastor Rochelle moved from Idaho to Orange County. Um, but grew up in Idaho. Uh, my mom is born and raised in Idaho. She's a farmer's daughter. So, like, she's, like, true, true Idaho, true country. Um, we grew up going to Gooding on the ranch every summer. Well, we went all the time, but I loved to go in the summer and work on the ranch with my grandma and grandpa. Um, and it was just, there was some, we were the city kids, you know. We were in Boise, which to you guys would be like, oh, that's cute. It's a small town. But when you grow up in Idaho and you go to Gooding, we were city kids, you know. We were like big time. Um, but there, we just, there's something so special about Idaho. Obviously, it's a very agricultural state. You're welcome. You get potatoes. All your French fries are from us. You're welcome. Don't make fun of Idaho. You wouldn't have French fries. So, we're just like, I love Idaho. You can drive and you just get in the country. You roll down the windows and there, there's nothing like that country smell. Like there is just, it's, there's just, come on. You're like, you just feel like you're closer to Jesus right there, you know? You guys are like, oh no, it's the ocean. No, trust me, it's the country and the sunsets. Like it's unreal. But we laugh in Idaho because a lot of people have moved from California to Idaho for various reasons. You guys think this is the God's country, but obviously there's something in Idaho because <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of you move. Um, so we've had a lot of people from California, our whole lives, people from California and other places, but really recently more and more. Well, one of the things people always tell you, if you move from California to Idaho, the first thing you need to do is change your license plate. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's kind of like a funny thing. And I don't even know if it's true. We just tell people that. I think we're just mean. We're like, oh, you better change your license plate. People key your cars. And I don't think that happens. We just like to mess with the Californians. So, but it's funny. When someone moves from California, we know they're from California. And it's not the license plate. It's not their aggressive driving. It's not their clothes. It's not the way they talk. It's what we like to call the California hustle. And you got to remember, we're agriculture. Like, we're like, and we're not like country podong. You're not going to walk around and see everybody in a cowboy hat. It's not like that. But we come from, we're the Wild West. So we're like, you know, we like to just wake up, look at the sunrise, drink a cup of coffee, take our time getting to the next event. We like a leisure drive to work. Yeah. You know, we like to take a long lunch. Yeah. You know, we like to, at the end of the day, we like to get home and just watch the sunset and chill on, be on a rocking chair, you know, just sitting in the backyard. You all come and it's like, calm down. I mean, the Californians will come to our church and I'm like, here they come. They're like, okay, Pastor Tracy, what we need to do is starting tomorrow. And I'm like, take it down a notch first, okay? You know, we're like, we'll get there. No, we got to do it now. And I'm like, oh, we will. Bless your heart. Like, you moved here. We're peaceful, you know? So we always laugh. All the Idahoans are like, the California hustle's coming out. That California rush. But there's something like in Idaho, it's like we like a slow drive. We're, we, we're, we're planters. We're farmers. We're agriculturists. There's something that God has done in the life of a farmer that understands something. You can't always speed everything up. Some things take time. 
my grandpa John, my mom's um, papa John, my mom's dad was an incredible farmer. And when I would go to Gooding for summers, um, on Sunday nights, my grandma and grandpa go, okay, come on, Trace, we're going to go in the car and we're going to go on a drive. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a break from the usual just sitting around on the farm <laughs> talking to the birds and the animals. So we'd get in the car and we'd go on a drive. And it was a slow drive. You all would have lost your minds. You would have been like, you know, like speeding around, honking, trying to like push him off the road. And so we're on the country. And you know what my grandpa wanted to do? My grandpa wants to drive around throughout the country, all the gooding and all the neighbor's crops. And he wanted to check out all the crops. And we would go and he'd be like, Tracy, what's that? And I'd be like, alfalfa. Tracy, what's that? Potatoes. What? Tracy, what's that? Corn. Like I had to learn, like he would teach me what the crops were and it was like a test. And he would let me know, like, oh, that crop's doing good. Oh, there, there's, is, there's is looking good. And he would always go to look at the crops. There's something about farming that's so maddening, though, because there's a long wait period. From the time that you plant a seed to the time that you see the, pr the, pr the produce or the fruit can be a long wait. The problem with our generation and our culture is that we're so used to things being like this that we bring that into our relationship with God. And if we're not careful, we get so in our little, God bless you all Californians, but your little hustle and your rush, you'll bring to God. Like, and, and sometimes we do it because we think it's faith. And it is. But even in faith, God knows the times and seasons, right? He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. And so I have to be careful, and I can be like this too, because when my faith gets going, I mean, you, like Pastor Rochelle, if you get Pastor Rochelle, my mom, Pastor Connie, and I in a prayer room together, which we were praying yesterday for our sweet Jonah back in Boise, and we were like, all, it was like fiery, you know, like we'll just go. But at the end of the day, what do I know? I release it into the, the timing is in God's hands. But we've become so conditioned in this culture, haven't we? To everything being like this. Do you know that our generation um, we will pay 40% more in the United States. We will pay 40% more to have something faster. We all do it. Express shipping, done. Right? Do you know that there is there are statistics about how long we'll wait for a video to load before we shut down? It's two seconds. If that thing doesn't load in two seconds, we bail. It's like, I don't have time for that. I got to keep moving. And I get it. We're busy. We're, we have many hats that we're wearing. We're juggling a lot of things. But when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, the problem is our hastiness. Sometimes we come to God and we go, why, am, why aren't I bearing fruit? I've been coming to oceans for years. I've been praying for my husband. I've been praying for my kids. I've been praying for this miracle. Where is it? And just like the parable what happens after three years, this guy comes by every day and says, there's no fruit. What's his response? Cut it down. Wow. He says, cut it down. Now, the vine dresser in this text is representing Jesus. And Jesus says, no, give me one more year. Give me one more year. Let me dig into it a little bit. Let me nourish it. Let me put some manure on it. And let me see what happens in a year. When's the last time that God spoke a promise to you and you said, well, let, let's give it a year. We're like, let's give it a week. Let's give it one month. Six months is pushing it, Jesus, but we'll let you. We never go, okay, God, I'm going to give it a year. Because we, we want the fruit. But fruitfulness is always followed by faithfulness. Fruitfulness is the byproduct of faithfulness. And the last time I checked, faithfulness is a process. And it's consistent. And sometimes it's like you're pushing, right? Have you ever felt like you wake up and you're like, I don't, I don't got it in me. And you go, nope, you stir it up. What does the Bible say? You stir up your most holy faith. And you have to, you have to put yourself back in the condition of faith. And you have to continue to walk in that journey. If God gives you a word, what do you do? You hold on to that word. You claim that word. You speak that word. You declare that word. And when a week goes by, if it doesn't happen, what do you do? You keep declaring that word. You keep claiming that word. You keep prophesying that word. 
And sometimes, and I don't know why, it can take a year. And obviously this parable, because it's a parable, is not trying to say, oh, in every single one of your situations right now, it's going to be exactly a year. So wait for June 22nd, 2025. But for some, it could be. But the context is this. Don't cut off the tree if you don't see the promise in the time frame that you've been hoping for. We're the kind of culture, we're like, cut it down. Just get rid of it. But here, God wants us, he wants us to walk in long obedience. See, we love beginnings, don't we? We love the, the, the baby new smell, you know? We like, we like new presidents. We like, <laughs> I know. I know where I am. We like new clothes. We like the new car smell, right? But what happens to all those things? Fades. The baby doesn't smell so good anymore. It's throwing up on you all the time. Poops like crazy. The new car smell wears off. The new president does something you don't like. New clothes are only new one time you wear them and you're over it, right? No, just kidding. But we like beginnings. And we like newness. And those things aren't wrong. But we like the allure of them, and we don't, we don't give ourselves to the long process of faithfulness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's something in the journey. Yeah. There's power in the process. Yeah. I, I look back at my life and seasons of my life, and, you know, in the moment, you're like, I wish this would go by faster. Yeah. But I look back, and I'm like, right. thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God yeah. that you walked me through the timeline that you did. Like, I'm so thankful that God gave me all my years of singleness. And I just want to shout out to all the single ladies. Enjoy it. It's the best. Go do all the things that are in your heart that God speaks to you. Like, you're not waiting. It's not, we've, we've taught something wrong in the church. That you arrive and you can, you can walk in the ministry and you can do all these things. Stop. Find that in the Bible for me and we'll talk later. It's not. You are who God's made you to be. And so in the waiting and in the process, and maybe you're waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. Maybe you're waiting on a miracle that God has given, that has told you is going to happen. Maybe you're waiting for just like the purpose in your life. You're like, God, what is it that you've called me to? And you're getting frustrated in the process and you just are waiting for the miracle. And it's like, no, stop. Let God put some manure on your life. You know what's funny about manure? There is nothing awesome about it. It's stinky, it's cheap. It's this world, our world economy would not put any value in it. But what does it do? It fertilizes. It's crucial for planting. It's crucial for life. It's crucial for a tree to bear fruit, to have fertilizer. But we just got, throw it off like, oh, what a waste of time. It's stinky, it's a waste. The world doesn't even think it's awesome. Come on, let's just get fruit. It's like, no. God has called us in our lives to bear fruit, yes. But there is a season of the waiting, just like the farmer, that we need to dig around it, dig up the rocks of your life. I mean, so many people, there was such a common theme up here about forgiveness, repentance, yielding. You know what that is? Digging up the rocks of your life. And then you pour manure on it, which is the fertilizer, that starts to regenerate life. What was dead all of a sudden can have new life. Yeah. Right. Several years ago, I had a tree in our, at my house that was diseased. And it was like really, it wasn't every, it, like half the limbs would be, um, I don't know that much about trees, so just work with me. You know, several of the limbs would be, um, you know, like they weren't producing any leaves and it was just looking weird. And so I'd prune it because, you know, that's biblical. And, um, you know, and I was like, that's what you do, right? You just prune it and it gets better and it wasn't getting better. And so I called my mom because we call our moms about everything. Um, like we're in our forties and it's like, mom, what do we do? And she's like, oh gosh, these children, you know, no, she's never like that. She's this, oh, this is funny. Yesterday when we were a fly or a couple days ago, we were flying. Mom and I don't usually travel together. So it was really fun. I always text my mom when I'm taking off and landing. Have you ever seen those memes? 
It's like, I'm 40, I'm a mom and a wife, and I still text my mom. So I went to go text, and I was like, oh, you're sitting by me. I guess I'll text dad and my husband. But it's like, you know, you always need your mom. Okay, so um, my, I called my mom. I'm like, mom, what do I do? Can you come look at this tree? And she goes, you call a tree doctor. And I was like, there are tree doctors? She's like, oh, yeah, there's tree doctors. She's like, let me send you a number, call a tree doctor. So I call this tree doctor. He comes out to look at this tree. And he goes, yeah, there's definitely, it's, it's disease. There was like a beetle that had gotten into the root and was causing the tree to, to die. And so I was like, well, what do you do? And he goes, well, we're going to treat it and then you need to soak it. And I had to like soak it for like an hour, like twice a day. So I'd have to get up in the morning and put the hose on there and you couldn't have it too much. You know, there was like a process to it. And I was like, this seems like, could I hire someone for this? So I go out there and I put the hose on the, you know, it's gotta be on like kind of the roots and the trunk. And I put the water there and I would wait, put a timer on and then give it a break, do it again in the evening. And so I'd been doing that for the amount of time that the, the tree doctor said. And then I said, okay, now, now what do I do? And he goes, you wait. I was like, I wait for what? He goes, you wait for the spring. And this was like probably the end of summer and the fall. And he goes, you just, you wait. And if next spring it bears the leaves, then you've gotten rid of the beetle and it's now a healthy tree. And I was like, so I have to wait like nine months? <laughs> and he was like, yeah. So I remember God speaking to me through that, that that's going to be, I think, honestly, many of us in our lives there have been things that have happened and things that God has spoken or things that we're holding on to or things that we're believing for. And we don't realize that God is in the middle of answering it, but there's a waiting. And isn't God the best at his timing? He knows exactly when to do what he wants to do. But there's oftentimes a wait. Jesus isn't in a hurry. Jesus isn't panicked. What does he do when they're in a storm, in a boat? He sleeps. He's not panicked. What does he do when Jairus comes to him and says, my, my daughter has died? He lets a woman with an issue of blood come to him, and he heals her, and then he goes and heals. By the time he gets to Jairus' daughter, she's dead. He's not panicked. What does he say to her? Rise up. See, our timing is not God's timing. He has the long view of your life. And he's not worried. He knows your future. He's already in your future. He knows that promise. He already sees the reconciliation in your family. He already sees the healing in your body. He already sees those babies in the future. He already sees that husband coming back to Jesus. He already sees the promise of God. And all he calls us to do, put some manure on it, fertilize it, water it, and wait. My job is not to heal me. My job is not to heal my family or restore. My job is not to save this world. My job is to put some manure on the seed and to trust God and then to wait. And to wait. And waiting, we all know, is not fun or glamorous or what we want to do. But have you ever pushed God's timing? Have you ever jumped over something and said, God, I've been waiting, but it's taking too long, and you take it into your own hands? How does that work out? And then you walk in the consequences of that. And then you cry out to God, God, why? And he's like, because you didn't throw some manure and wait. I had a plan. See, God is involved in every detail of your story. And I think our, our, our knee-jerk reaction is to give up in the middle of the story. And we forget that we're just like, a, we're chapters in, and there's many chapters to go. And our, our, our idea and our plan sometimes is when things aren't bearing fruit, when things aren't going the way that we want them to, our response is cut it down. Now, what's interesting about the fig tree is the fig tree in Israel, it was a very common tree. And the ones that were diseased and that weren't producing fruit not only caused a problem for that tree, but it actually affected the soil and the other trees around it. So that's why when he comes, he's like, cut it down. 
Jesus, the vine dresser, comes and says, no, no, no. Not only am I going to fix this tree, but I am going to fix all the soil that's in and around this, and it's going to impact all the other fig trees. Our healing and our miracle is never just for us. It's always for the glory of God. It's always for other people. And so he, what he wants to do in your life and what he, he wants you to produce fruit. We were called and created to produce fruit in our lives. But we're called to produce it in the timing of God. And if you want to go deep, guess what? You have to wait. Faithfulness is a journey, isn't it? Depth requires time. We, we can't be deep in the things of God overnight. I, I've spent years, I feel like I still know, there's so much more I need to know about God. There's so much more I want to know about his presence. There's so much more I want to know about his word. I don't give up because I feel overwhelmed. I just keep going. And then each new season, he produces more. Each new season, he gives new visions. Each new season, he gives new revelation and fresh insight. But how does it happen? I keep going. And I'm waiting on God. We have got to be women who don't put Jesus in a box and tell him to rush. But we let Jesus do what he's going to do in the timing of God. He knows exactly what you need. Free, uh, um, Nietzsche, who was uh, a 19th century atheist, really, always said this about Christianity, even though he, he, had, he had believed as a young boy and then he had become an atheist, but he always said this about Christianity. The thing about Christians is they have a long obedience in the same direction. They have a long obedience in the same direction. If you ever want to tell someone, what's it like to be a believer? Oh, I just have long obedience in the same direction. My hope is in Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. My life is in Jesus. Well, well, but things aren't going so great. Oh, oh yeah, they, they are. Because he's there and I have long obedience in the same direction. I'm not going to quit. Like all these stories, like Mel's telling her testimony, Pastor Mel, it's like, you could have quit. Guess what? We don't because we have the long view. And Jesus is in your story. In 2 Kings, it says this. It says, um, and the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Now, Judah at this time, remember the Assyrians had come and taken over Israel. They had conquered Israel, and they were all like in exile. All the Jews had become in exile. Well, then we get to 2 Kings, and now there's a remnant that's left that survived. And the word that is spoken over them is, you will again take root downward to bear fruit upward. If you're going to bear fruit, what has to happen? You have to take root. And you have to take a deep root. Have you ever, have you ever planted something not deep enough? What happens? Falls over. The first wind that comes knocks it over. But when you plant deep, deep roots produce amazing fruit. And God has called every single one of you to produce fruit. And not fruit that just like is, you know, floating around and it does something good, but fruit that remains, the Bible says. Fruit that outlasts you. Fruit that affects your children and your grandchildren, that affects generations to come. We are called to be women of faith that no matter what comes in our face, we can, one, believe that God is who he says he is, and two, he will do it when he says the time is right. How refreshing is that? I don't have to do it. He's just called me to be a gardener of my soul where I come and I dig the roots around it and I dig some rocks up and I pull some weeds and I throw some manure. I get in the word. I spend time in prayer. I get around a company of women full of faith. I have people mentoring and speaking into my life and I nourish the seed and the root and before you know it, fruit will appear on the vine. And it won't be fruit that doesn't matter. It will be fruit that Jesus has always determined to put in and through your life. And it affects the people around you. 
because you have a call and a purpose and a plan that nobody else in human history can accomplish. If they could, he would have put them here in this time and space, but he chose you in your mother's womb. Woo. He designed you, he formed you. Your purpose was set all the way back there and he's never given up on his promise. You might be one who thinks, well, I haven't produced very much fruit. If you looked at the story and the, and the fruit of my life, and you would be like, oh, that's, that's cool. But Jesus comes to say, the vine dresser, pour some manure on it, water it, dig around it, and wait. Wait for the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God who draws us to him. It's the faithfulness of our God when we are faithless that cause, causes us to just come into his presence and desire to be with him. I feel so strongly that there are many women who have either cursed the tree that God's given them and said, what's the point, cut it down. Or you have just given up on ever bearing fruit. And I'm here to tell you something throw some manure on it and give it a year. You're the remnant that God has called to California. Thank God we have a remnant in California. And he says to you, California, you awesome California hustle ladies, from the slow paced Idaho gal, I say this, you take root downward so that you will bear fruit upward but get your roots deep, get them deep. Don't just sort of plant yourself, get yourself deep into God. And all these women gave you the most practical, incredible ways of doing that. Come on, open up your Bible, get a part of a prayer community or a small group, ask people to walk alongside of you. There's power in us taking root. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do something. Guess what? Healthy things are deeply rooted. And deep roots grow strong and flourishing fruit. And you know what strong and flourishing fruit do? They change the world. You know what changes the world? The fruit of our lives. The fruit of our lives is what will point people to Jesus. And so I'm here to tell you, there is fruit left in you. I speak it over, there are people in the room, there are women in the room who think their fruit is dead, that there's no more left. I speak Psalm 92 to you that says you will bear fruit in old age. God's not done with you. He has not given up on you. He's not disappointed in you. He's been waiting for you. And I speak to the dead fruit and the dead branches, just like that diseased tree. And I say right now, Holy Spirit, nourish the roots of their heart nourish their lives. Lord, right now, the washing of the water of the word come and fill them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Whatever the devil has spoken over you, I pick that up like a weed and I pull it out of your spirit. And I say to you, just like Jesus says, the vine dresser, give it a year, give more time, because he's in the miracle. The miracle is in motion. There is something happening on the inside of you and we speak life to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we declare there is life. Lord, we desire fruit, but we've got to submit to God's time. Several years ago, before I was like a mom and a wife, you know, when I was the fun gal, the single one, you know, I traveled over the world. That's how I met Lucille in those seasons, and you were so encouraging and always like, you're gonna be married one day. Like we talk about it now, it was so fun. She knew me in my crazy single season of pastoring alone. And she was such an incredible friend to me and such an encourage. She's just a courager is who she is. I love you so much, Lucille. I remember I was traveling, I was doing something and um, I was scuba diving and I was close to being like certified, but never happened, okay? So we're, we move on. But I was scuba diving and I'd never had this trouble before. If you've ever gone scuba diving, you have to, your ears have to equalize as you're going down. So you slowly go, you know, like, however many feet. And I had scuba dived many, I was like a couple dives away from being certified. 
or being like a master diver, whatever it's called, I don't know. It's no big deal, um, except it never happened. Okay, so I, I remember um, this time uh, and I was, it was frustrating because I'm like, why aren't my e ears equal? I just want to get down there. And it's embarrassing because you're with a group and they're all waiting for you and they have to wait with the instructors with you. And so it's like one of those, you know those moments where you're like letting the team down? They're like, I never want to be the girl that lets the team down. That's like, you, that crushes me more than anything. So I'm letting the team down. I'm like trying so hard. And the more I'm trying, the more frustrating it gets, you know? And my aunt was with me and she's just like, it's okay. You know, she's talking through, you, you can't really talk, but she's like, you know, whatever she's saying. I don't remember how long it took, but it took a really long time for me for whatever reason to equalize my ears and get all the way down. And I was, by the time I got to, to where we needed to be, I was just defeated. I was like, well, this is pointless. I wasted the time for everyone. What a, you know, this is, we're barely gonna be down here and then we're just gonna have to go up to the surface. And I was just frustrated. And all of a sudden my aunt and the instructor goes, look up. And they were telling me to look up and I was like, what? I look up and I turn around and there are just like turtles everywhere. And the whole group had been spending all this time just with these turtles having the time of their life. No one was worried about me. They didn't even realize we should be going anywhere else. And I was so frustrated in the process and in the journey. But once I got there, I was like, oh my gosh. What if I would have given up? What if I would have said, we're done, I'm going to the top, this is pointless. I would have missed the thing that God wanted to show me. How many times do we give up? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't curse your tree. Do not curse your life. There is life in you. There is fruit in you. There is purpose in you. There's a plan for you. God has big plans. And it is fruit that will shape a generation. It is fruit that will change the course of a generation and a country and a world. We will not be women who quit. We will be women who stand firm. We will believe the promises of God. We will stand firm in what he says, because he is not a man who would lie. I speak over every one of you, any promise that he's put in your heart. Lord, we pray manure, fertilize it, treat it, nourish it, regenerate it, bring new life today in the name of Jesus. I speak specifically, I felt it. Second Kings is your scripture for those of you. And if this is you, I want, I just want you to, actually I want you to come to the front if this is you. If you have felt like it's, it, your, your season is over, there's no more fruit for you to bear, or you've cursed the tree and said, just cut it off, get rid of it. You've said to your life, my life has no purpose, there's no plan for me, or I'm past the time for anything good for God to do in me. I want you to come to the front. Because God says to you, you are going to, take root deepward and bear fruit upward. I want you to come all along up here and we're gonna pray for you. Come on, wherever you are. We're gonna agree in prayer and we're gonna cut that lie. We're gonna cut the lie off. The devil has tried to lie to you, has tried to discourage you, has tried to keep you off track. And I'm here to tell you there's life in you. There's more fruit. There's a long life with a lot of fruit. There's good things in your future, good things. I see the, the blessings of God on your life that makes rich and adds no sorrow to you. It's blessing, I see favor. There's a scripture in the Bible that says he gives you favor with both God and man. I see God giving you favor with people that you couldn't even imagine. There is deep fruit in you, deep fruit, fruit that extends past just your family I believe God's giving you influence with the fruit that God gives in you. You will produce fruit in many decades, for many decades more. It's not the end. In fact, this is a beginning. I declare it over you. Don't give up. There's been something you've been praying for and believing for decades, I feel like the Holy Spirit says, don't give up. We agree right now in the name of Jesus, this is the year. This is the year. Let it be according to your word. This is the year. Don't give up. Don't give up. Lord, we pray for every single one of these incredible women down here. You know the stories. You know the past. You know what you're writing about them. And I pray right now, fruit. 
would come springing up. Woo! There's a well. There's a deep well. Bubble up on the inside of you. Pray right now, Holy Spirit, you would give her a vision of what you've called for her to do. Give her a vision. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak to every single one of these women. Your tree won't die. Your branches won't be fruitless. You aren't barren. I declare and I decree and I prophesy over you that you will bear fruit this season. That this year, as you fertilize it, as you give it to God and you yield to his timing and his process, he will do what only he can do. I release right now, Holy Spirit. Whoo. Jesus. Resurrect dreams. Resurrect dreams. Nourish the seed. Dig up some roots. Unforgiveness, be gone. Bitterness, be gone. Whatever is holding back the fruit, Holy Spirit, reveal it right now. If the Holy Spirit is revealing something to you, that his, that the lie, or maybe there is something you haven't yielded to God, I want you with your own voice right now, if you're up here or anywhere in this tent, release it right now to Holy Spirit. Say, God, I release this. I've cursed this, I've doubted, maybe I've held unforgiveness. Release it right now in the name, there is power in your confession. Release it right now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Royale. Woo, girl. I have, like, in the middle of worship, I was just, like, worshiping, and I turned and saw you, and I just saw the glory of God all around you. There's some really deep, anointed, creative things in you. And I, I think you've utilized them. I don't know. I really don't know you that well. Like, I've met you over the years, you know. You've been here, and I don't know you very well, but I feel like there's a deep creativity in you. Like you have like a genius creativity. And I feel like you've used it sometimes and in some seasons, but it, I felt when I was praying for you earlier, I felt like it got put on a shelf. And it was there, but it was on a shelf. And I saw the Holy Spirit during worship come and take whatever that was on the shelf and he threw it at you. And I saw things that you're gonna produce, create, that are going to change the landscape of things. I think, I think it, it's a part of the church, but I think it's evangelistic too. I saw the Holy Spirit using skills and creative ideas of things and it, it impacts churches and countries and it goes way beyond what you could ever fathom. And I just wanna encourage you, I know maybe there's been a season where it's been put on a shelf for a little bit, but God never said that died. He never said, oh, we're not getting to that. I just feel like the Holy Spirit says the time is now. I'm putting things back in you. I'm putting it in motion and it's gonna accelerate. Dreams you had in the past didn't die, they're resurrected. And in fact, now they're even bigger. So I just pray over you, Roya, release all that you have for her. Lord, you have something significant for her. She is gifted and called. In her mother's womb, there was a purpose. You created her exactly how you want her to be because she has something nobody else has. And I see you releasing. I see you blossoming right now like a flower. You've been a beautiful bud, but now you're like this open peony that's just blossoming. It's the most beautiful flower anyone has ever seen. I release you right now into the fullness of what God has called you to do. There is a plan, there's a call, there's a purpose. Release it in Jesus' name. I pray new creative visions. I pray she'd wake up and be like, oh my gosh, I had this crazy dream and you have to write it down because God's gonna speak to you through your dreams. He's gonna speak to you through visions. You're gonna get strategy and ideas of how to creatively spread the gospel and to, and to turn people to Jesus that nobody else can reach, Royale, but you because there's a plan on your life. I release you. You're not just Bodhi's wife. You're not just a mom. You're Royale. You're powerful in the kingdom. You're powerful in the kingdom. 
and we also love you, but we love you. And there's a plan and a purpose. Come on, Jesus. Come on. We want to bear fruit. We're not going to die. We're not going to be cut off. We're not going to miss the revival. We're not going to miss the plans of God. Come on, ladies. If you want Jesus to nourish the thing in your life, if you want him to fertilize it, come on, lift your hands right now. Let's receive. Say, Jesus, do what you can do. We yield to your time. And now we ask you, fertilize it. You nourish it. And you produce fruit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, let the Holy Spirit, come on, just for a few minutes, for 30 seconds. Come on, you just let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Spirit break out. Break our walls down. Spirit break out. Heaven come.
I thank you that businesses are being restored. Lord, I see women entrepreneurs and that have had a difficult, challenging year, and I see you're fertilizing, you're nourishing, and you're resurrecting. I see marriages restored. I see bodies healed. I see children, prodigal sons and daughters coming home. Jesus, I see miraculous things happening in the company of these women. There's power in collective faith. There's power in community. I see a great move of God coming out of this group of women. Your prayers will change the course of things. I just, there's power in agreement. Holy Spirit. God gave me a vision earlier this week. A vision like I've never seen and many of you have been praying and contending with us for a young boy in our church. And one night I was praying for him and Jesus showed me angels outside of his door that are guarding and Jesus was laying with him smiling saying it's well, all is well. And then Jesus took me to Capitol Church and he showed me all these angels that were just celebrating in our sanctuary. And then he took me to Ocean's Church to the tents. And I saw them bouncing on the tents and doing somersaults and doing the, I don't think we realize how joyful heaven is. God's not scared. He's not in turmoil. He's not worried about your life and your future. He's rejoicing. I think we need heaven to come to earth. And we need to rejoice in the victory that is ours. Some of you just keep waiting and then I'll rejoice. Waiting and, and I said to the Holy Spirit says, rejoice now. All of heaven is already rejoicing with you. They're celebrating. And then today in the tents, as we were worshiping, I looked up and I was like, am I gonna see him? Am I gonna see him? They were doing somersaults all over the top of the tent. I had to submit this vision to my parents who are elders because I'm like, do angels do that? That seems like they're like protective and minister and, my, and they're like, yeah, think of how much joy there is. When you start worrying about the timing and the season and the life, you start thinking about heaven. It's rejoicing over you. It's celebrating. You're surrounded. You're protected. You will not die, but you will live and declare the great things of God. You will have fruit in old age. So if you're young, you got decades and decades and decades. And if you're one of our more mature ladies, you still got time. You're bearing fruit. God has a plan and a purpose. Come on, lift your hands to heaven just for a second. Jesus, we thank you so much. You hear us, you see us, you know us, and you have plans for us. Lord, I pray right now you would give each woman in here a vision of what you've called them to. And when the enemy tries to come in and disrupt, discourage, remind him of the vision. Remind him of the promise. Lord, I thank you that you promise us you will give us fruit and it will remain. And it will last our lifetime. So Jesus, we receive all the benefits of heaven. We receive all the promises of God. We say they are yes and amen and yes and amen and yes and amen. And we declare, I declare, that this group of women will produce so much fruit. I pray that the state of, not just Orange County, but the state of California will shift in the direction of Jesus. I believe we will see it in a year's time. We speak to you, California, you are gods. We speak to you, women of California, you are destined for greatness. And we declare that God is doing something deep you will go deep and you will go up. You will produce fruit upward in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, if you believe it, will you just testify of his goodness? Will you thank him this morning? Will you celebrate with heaven? Will you rejoice with God? He's doing it. He's done it. He's on the way. Come on. Isn't he good? Amen. 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 Isn't 
God could. Can we give Pastor Tracy a huge hand? I know just as we end this, and maybe you came in the tents today, and you don't know this Jesus that my sister is talking about. Maybe you came in here hopeless, and you don't feel like you've had any fruit in your life. But I want to tell you, when you receive Jesus in your life, you will bear fruit. And maybe it's in the waiting. And maybe you've been waiting on a promise. But let me tell you, his word will not return back void. It will accomplish what it was sent to do. So maybe some of you came into the tents today and you said, you know what? I've given up on God because he hasn't fulfilled the promise. And so I want you today with heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you, if you say, Rochelle, I came in today hopeless. And I know a little bit about God, but I've given up on him because I haven't seen any fruit in my life. My, my life has been fruitless. So I wa but I want to know this Jesus that Pastor Tracy is talking about. If that's you in here or maybe you've fallen away from God because you haven't seen the fruit of God in your life. I want you to lift, pop up your hand really quick. I'll, I'll, just right now, pop up your hand, nobody's looking. Thank you, thank you for those hands, thank you, thank you, thank you. So could we just thank, can we give them a hand? If we could just say this prayer with them, say, Dear Jesus, I thank you for what you've done in my life. I receive you into my heart. I confess my sins and I receive you as Lord in Jesus' name. And if you believe that, you give God a shout of praise. It's awesome. It is hot in here. I don't know about you, but I feel like I have red cheeks because I'm hot. But I, I'm just so excited. God is good. And maybe you've not seen the fruit in your life. I'm telling you, keep waiting. Keep waiting on God because God is not a God that he will lie. His promises are yes and amen. So stand on the word. Believe that the promises you've been asking God for, God, I'm going to see them if I don't give up. So don't give up this week, amen, or in years to come. <laughs>